Religious liberty is an interesting subject for Christians. Because if you asked most Christians if they believed in religious liberty, they would say, of course I do. If they know some of their church history, they might know that the first known use of the term religious liberty was by the early church father, Tertullian, when he wrote that Christians should be as free to worship as any other person is to worship their God. Another early churchman named Lactantius was advisor to the emperor Constantine and influential in his religious policy. Remember, it was Constantine who issued the Edict of Milan that wasn't to establish Christianity as the state religion, as many assume. The Edict of Milan was to allow religious liberty for Christians as well as people of other faiths. So most Christians believe in religious liberty. But if you ask them where they get religious liberty from in the Bible, many of them are stumped on where to look. And this is so important because as Christians, we want to believe something, not just because it's popular or because it's historical. We want to believe something because it's biblical. And I want to start with a controversial Bible passage to, sh to show why some Christians get confused about this. So I'm reading from Leviticus chapter 24, verses 14 to 16, just after a man has cursed God's name. This is what God said should be done with him. Reading from verse 14. Take the blasphemer outside the camp. All those who heard him are to lay their hands on his head, and the entire assembly is to stone him. Say to the Israelites, anyone who curses their God will be held responsible. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. I wonder how you respond to that passage. It's a very clear passage. Blasphemy was punishable by death in ancient Israel. I think of the times God's name is blasphemed on TV, on a cooking show, or on a renovation show. How many executions would there have been if those shows were played in ancient Israel? But how do you respond to that passage? Do you think that it is a miscarriage of justice? I hope not. Because this is God's holy, infallible, inerrant word. God doesn't get things wrong. This execution was completely just. And if you're a Christian and if you find that unpalatable, you need to remember that a punishment much worse awaits blasphemers when Jesus returns to judge. But I want us to see that the biblical case for religious liberty isn't simple. Old Testament Israel had God's just law, the, the gold standard of justice, and there was no religious liberty there. If you blasphemed God's name, you would be executed, as we've just seen. If you prophesied falsely or in the name of another God, you would be executed, Deuteronomy 18.22. If you worshipped another God, you would be executed, Deuteronomy 17.7. I want to stress that I believe in religious liberty, but I don't want to skirt around the difficult passages. And I should say that the nation of Israel had radical religious liberty for the ancient world. It was God who rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt so that they could be free to worship him. And then Israel wasn't forced to enter into covenant with God. They voluntarily entered covenant with God in Exodus 24. It was only after they voluntarily bound themselves to God, that religious liberty was restricted. But still, modern people are very shocked by such laws against blasphemy and idolatry. And Christians might be tempted to say, well, that was the Old Testament, and we're New Testament Christians. But it's not that simple. That certainly wasn't Jesus' attitude to God's law. In Matthew 5.17, he says he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He says... Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Paul held the law in the same high regard. In Romans 7.12, he says the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. You, you can't simply throw the Old Testament under the bus. That's the ancient heresy of Marcion. It's the modern heresy of liberalism. So how can we believe in religious liberty if we believe in the goodness of God's law? To answer that, we need to get into a broader discussion on the role of government. And I've got a diagram here that can help us. I've got two rectangles on the screen that look like two fridges next to each other. And each of these rep rectangles represents a different political system. I'm looking at two, but there are many more political systems we could explore. 
The political system on the left is liberal democracy. Living in a modern Western country, this is what we're used to. Regular elections, division of power amongst the branches of government, private property, civil liberty. It's great. I've grown up with it. I'm guessing that we all love it. The political system on the right is called theonomy. You might not have heard of this one, but it's a political theory advocated by some thoughtful, logical Christians in the United States. And I want to consider these two political systems because I think they are helpful foils to help us arrive at a truly Christian understanding of government and religious liberty. But before we do, there's another distinction we have to make on the diagram. I'm going to put a horizontal line across the screen right through these rectangles that divides every political system into two. Because in every political system, there are two kinds of people. There are the people above the line, called the rulers, and there are the people below the line, called the subjects. So in a monarchy, there is one person above the line, called the king, and everyone else is below the line, as the subjects. A democracy is a little more complex because we are both rulers and subjects. We act as rulers above the line when we elect the government, or if we are elected to government, and we act as subjects below the line when we obey the government. But it's a helpful distinction to make in every system. Now, I want us to see that it's actually quite simple for Christians who are below the line. If you are a subject, your instructions are very clear. Romans 13 verse 1 says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Now, if God inspired that verse concerning the brutal Roman Empire, then we can be confident that we need to submit ourselves to government in modern liberal liberal democracies. It says in verse 7, if you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So when Christians claim they shouldn't pay the government tax, they're disobeying the Bible. It's just repeating what Jesus said in Matthew 22, 21, when he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. We're called to pray for our leaders, 1 Timothy 2, verse 2, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. Being below the line is very simple for Christians. We're to obey, submit, pay taxes, and pray for our rulers. A ruler should find Christians to be their best subjects. There are exceptions. In Acts 4, 19, it is clear that the Christians' obedience to God trumps their obedience to the government. So if the government wants to force the Christian To sin, the Christian can disobey the government. Actually, the Christian must disobey the government. Similarly, if the government wants to prevent a Christian from doing something that God commands, like sharing the gospel, the Christian must disobey the government in that case too. We should also know that the Christian is free to seek legal recourse. Paul appealed to Roman law when he was wrongfully imprisoned in Acts 16.37. If an authority is abusing a Christian and the Christian has legal recourse, they're under no obligation to submit to the abuse, but can freely pursue legal recourse. But all in all, it is very simple, and the Christian below the line has one thing to do, and that is to submit. That makes religious liberty below the line very simple as well. It doesn't matter what the laws of the land are, it doesn't matter what religious liberty a Christian lives under. Whether the government grants religious liberty or not, the Christian must submit to the authorities in every case, except those that would cause them to disobey God. But what about above the line? Well, things get a lot trickier above the line, and I think this is where the confusion comes in. Because what happens when a Christian becomes a ruler? How should they govern? A helpful question to ask is, if you as a Christian were to become king or queen, how would you rule? This is where it doesn't work for Christians to quote 1 Corinthians 5.12 saying we should only judge people inside the church and not those outside. Because those words were written to the church to instruct about church discipline. They weren't written to the government. The church has no business exercising church discipline outside the church. But if you are a ruler, it is precisely your role to judge everyone, whether they are inside the church or not. And if a member of the church is king, he had better judge those outside the church or you'd be left with murderers running riot in the streets. You can't say Christian rulers should not judge. So again, the question is, if you, as a Christian, were to become king, how would you rule? What laws would you impose on the nation? And we should be clear on this too. People often say, you can't impose your morality. Or they say, you can't legislate morality. But the thing is that every single piece of law is moral. Whenever you tell someone they should or shouldn't do something, you've entered the realm 
of morality. The law against murder is an imposition of morality against the murderer. The law against theft is an imposition of morality against the thief. Every single law is, imp is imposing morality. You can't escape it. The question is, whose morality are you going to impose? And this is where we've run into problems with liberal democracy. For a number of decades, liberal democracies in the Western world have got by okay. They were founded on a common moral understanding that came from the Bible and especially from the moral law of Moses. But over time, this theological dimension of law has backed into the shadows and it became the case that laws were decided more by a consensus of what seems moral to the citizens and leaders of these nations. And again, this was going okay as long as there was a fairly sizable moral consensus in the nation that was based on the Christian heritage we all had. Even if people weren't really Christian or were only nominally Christian, they still broadly agreed on Christian morality. The difficulty has now come because there is no longer such a consensus. Many people are openly hostile to our Christian heritage and have a very different view of what morality should be imposed in the form of legislation. They try to pretend that they're not imposing morality, but they still are. It's just that the standard of morality is no longer related to Christianity. Instead, they are secular standards related to things like individual autonomy and government-enforced compassion. And because secular society has abandoned the Bible as a foundation for absolute morality, it means the secular moral standards are constantly shifting and they are self-contradictory. So you have people excluded in the name of inclusion. You have uniformity of thought in the name of diversity. One moment individual choice is paramount, the next moment the fact that someone was born that way is paramount. One moment the feminist secularists want you to account for gender in constructing policy, the next minute the transgender secularists want you to ignore gender in policy because it's just a fluid social construct anyway. What is regarded as progressive today will be regarded as regressive tomorrow. There's no absolute standard like the Bible to measure against. Instead, leaders will use their power to impose their idiosyncratic version of the good life on others. But there's no standard to measure their version of the good life by. You can't engage in meaningful debate about the good life because there is no frame of reference for what is good in the first place. It's like everyone wants to measure a meter and they all bring measuring tape without any markings. And so instead of reasoned debate, you just shout slogans at each other and call each other names. Without any objective standard, liberal democracy is destined to become either the tyranny of the mob or the tyranny of the demagogue. One of America's founding fathers and their second president, John Adams, said, Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. When the people are immoral and irreligious, liberty deteriorates into license, from freedom to do what is good into freedom to carry out your desires. And this is where the theonomic critique of liberal democ democracy is devastating. Like I said, you might not have heard of theonomy, but the theonomists come in and tell the liberal democratic Christians that they've got it all wrong. Because they sacrifice the standard of the Bible in order to get a seat at the table of polite society, they've inadvertently sacrificed the only consistent standard for making law. And the repeated question the theonomist asks is, by what standard? By what standard are you going to impose morality on society in the form of legislation? They see the mess of contradiction in secular standards, and so the theonomist says we need to be explicitly biblical. We must say f firmly, clearly, self-consciously that our only standard for what is good and evil is God himself, and he has revealed himself to us in his word. More than this, they say that the law of the Lord is perfect, Psalm 19, verse 7. They quote Jesus in Matthew 5, that nothing will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. They note how throughout the New Testament, it is assumed that the law continues to apply, except in the ceremonial laws that are fulfilled by Christ. They point to Psalm chapter 2, verses 10 to 12, which say, Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son lest he be angry with you, and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. They say if you're a Christian ruler, your number one accountability is not to the people or to the electorate. No, your number one accountability 
is to King Jesus. Submit to him. Rule under his rule. And even though I'm ultimately going to disagree with the theonomists, I want to say they've got something right here because they give us a solid standard to create law by. They say we should legislate God's good law and not man's shifting opinions. That makes sense to me. At least they have a consistent standard. But I don't believe in theonomy for one very good reason. I don't believe in theonomy because I don't believe it's biblical. It doesn't properly deal with redemptive history. It doesn't account for the fulfillment of the kingdom that has taken place in Jesus. See, Israel was God's chosen nation. God entered into solemn covenant with Israel, and Israel entered into solemn covenant with God. Israel was not so much a nation as it was a covenant community. And part of this covenant community was keeping God's law. They had to keep all of it. The moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law. And God promised in Deuteronomy 28 that if they did follow all his commands, then he would bless them. If they maintained the holiness of the nation, they would enjoy prosperity and big families, and victory over their enemies. If they did not obey, they would receive the curse of God. And if we can learn one lesson about the Israelite leaders seeking to maintain the holiness of the nation, we can learn that it was an abject failure. From the time of the judges to the time of the exile, the people were consistently led astray by their leaders. This is one reason why the government shouldn't try and implement blasphemy laws or enforce true worship. Because even if there were one godly leader who managed to establish religion perfectly, the example of the kings of Israel teaches us us, that the next leader will probably be rubbish and will embrace some form of idolatry. We cannot rely on sinful human rulers to establish proper holiness in the land. And this brings us to the second reason I don't believe in theonomy. It's because there is a sinless human ruler who has already established holiness and true worship. Jesus Christ is the King of kings who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Hebrews 10.22 says that when we trust in Jesus, we join with God's people in the heavenly Jerusalem. We don't try to establish true worship in a temporal earthly nation because the true worship has already been established in the eternal heavenly nation. And we have a king who is perfect and who will never die and will never be succeeded by a dud who will lead us astray. Jesus is no longer about establishing a covenant with an earthly nation state of Israel. He is true Israel. 1 Peter 2 says that as we come to Jesus, we become a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. It is by union with Christ that we enter the true Israel. It's not an Israel with national borders that we need to maintain as holy by force of law. No, this is an Israel that stakes out territory in the hearts of individual human beings. When someone puts their trust in Jesus, it's like Jesus places a flag on their heart and claims that territory for his kingdom. The true kingdom of God is transnational. We don't need to establish a shadow of the kingdom on earth because Jesus has already established the reality of the kingdom in heaven. And this has huge ramifications for religious liberty in our modern world. We've looked at principles of religious liberty for the subjects below the line. Based on what we covered, I'm now going to give five biblical principles for religious liberty for rulers above the line. The first principle is that there is no religious liberty before God. That might sound odd as a principle of religious liberty, but it's very important. There is no religious liberty before God. Revelation chapter 20 verse 8 says that the unbelieving and the idolaters will be thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. There will be no idolatry in God's kingdom. He will suffer no rivals. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 says Christians have turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Christians have no liberty before God to engage in idolatry. They have been rescued from that and now they worship the triune God in truth. Likewise, non-Christians have no liberty before God to engage in idolatry. They will be held accountable before God for their idolatry and blasphemy unless they find forgiveness in Jesus. Rulers who are above the line are not free before God to engage in idolatry. They are called to submit their authority to the true King Jesus. In fact, every form of authority must be submitted to King Jesus. Psalm 2 still applies. Therefore, you kings, be warned. Be wise, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. 
Like I said before, the theonomists are right about one thing, and that is that rulers are accountable to Jesus for how they exercise authority. There might be a separation between church and state when it is properly understood, but there will never be a separation between Christ and state. Rulers are accountable to God. And if you're listening to this, and you have any authority at all, you need to submit to Jesus. When the queen was crowned, she received an orb to represent the globe. On top of the orb was the cross. It was to remind her that even if she ruled over the whole world, there is still a king who rules over her. The second point is that the power of rulers is limited. Romans 13.4 says the ruler is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. That is the role of government, to punish wrongdoers. That is a very limited role for government. Now, I want us to be clear on two things. The first is that this assumes a moral standard. The ruler is not free to punish whatever they define as wrong. No, they must sit under the standard of God's moral law to determine what is wrong. This is objective evil behavior that is being punished, not punishment based on the subjective measure of someone's hurt feelings. The second thing we need to be clear on is that Romans 13 is interested in wrongdoing against other human beings, not wrongdoing against God. Jesus has delayed punishment for sin against God. Jesus is God's king, yet he was blasphemed in hundreds of ways during his earthly ministry. He was rejected and spat on. People turned their backs on him and walked away. Ultimately, they crucified him. At any point in time, Jesus could have executed justice for such blasphemy. He could have rained down fire from heaven or called legions of angels. But he did not seek retribution in the here and now. There is a future date for judgment. And for now, sin against God is to be left to that judgment. John Piper says, Jesus Christ the source and ground of all truth, will himself one day bring an end to all tolerance, and he alone will be exalted as the one and only Lord and Saviour and Judge of the universe. Therefore, since Jesus Christ alone, the Creator and Lord of history, has the right to wield the tolerance-ending sword, we dare not. Rulers must only punish objective wrong done against other people and wait on God to punish sin against God. Secularists get anxious when they hear of political leaders becoming Christians because they fear theocracy. But if secularists get power without the restraint of Jesus, they will simply set up a secular theocracy. The abortion clinics will conduct the sacrifices, the diversity councils will issue the blasphemy laws, and the state will bloat itself to godlike proportions as it tries to usher in its version of eschatological utopia. But when a ruler submits to King Jesus, they discover that their remit is severely limited. They are to punish the wrongdoer and they are to do this justly under the righteous rule of Jesus. See, the Christian rulers should enter government out of love. They love God and they love their neighbour and so they want to seek the welfare of the city even while this earthly city is not their home. Jeremiah 29.7 They want to be the answer to the prayers of those below the line in 1 Timothy 2.2 that they could live quiet and peaceful lives in all holiness. Christian rulers will rule because they want to lovingly serve their society. We should have a title to indicate that, shouldn't we? Of course we do. In the Latin version of Romans 13.4, where it says that a ruler is God's servant, the word used there for servant in Latin is minister. A minister is a great name for a ruler because they need to remember that they are servants. Romans 13.4 says they are God's servants. Our third point is that today is not the day of judgment. Today is the day of salvation. 2 Peter 3.9 says the Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Even though no one is free to engage in idolatry before God, God has given this period before Christ's return as a time of patience. This is a time for people to turn back to God through Jesus. It's a time of amnesty and mercy and grace. It is a time when even the most hardened blasphemers are called to repent and trust in Christ. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.13. He says, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. 
He says, verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I will show mercy so that, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. See, this is a time of patience, when blasphemers like Paul can be saved and transformed to become children of God and ministers of the kingdom. A ruler living under King Jesus must leave space for the Pauls of this world to live in blasphemy and sin as long as they are not doing wrong against another person. And they must do this in the hope that blasphemers like Paul will hear the good news of Jesus and enter the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is spread by gospel proclamation, not by the sword. In John 3 verse 3, Jesus says that in order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again of the Spirit. You only enter the kingdom of God by the Spirit. So the kingdom cannot be spread by the sword. Paul explicitly rejects the spread of the kingdom by worldly weapons in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. The only weapon for the kingdom is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6 verse 17. Peter makes it clear that people are born again through the word of God. 2 Peter 1 23. And if the kingdom can only grow through the three proclamation of the gospel, point four is that rulers must allow an open public square. If the gospel is to be proclaimed without fear, the public square must be open to the speech of all. The ruler's remit is not to judge between orthodoxy and heresy. If it were, they would most likely judge wrongly, like the leaders of ancient Israel. A godly ruler will allow liberty of speech so Christians can preach the gospel, even though this allows the possibility of false teaching. And they will allow liberty of worship so Christians can assemble, even though this allows the possibility of false worship. They will leave the judgment of false teaching and false worship to God and stick to their commission of judging people who do wrong to other people. The fifth and final point is that there is a limit to religious liberty, but the only coherent limit is the biblical limit. See, even though a Christian ruler will allow religious liberty, there are limits to it. The obvious example is someone who says their religion demands child sacrifice. That is where the government should limit religious liberty because they are now doing wrong against other humans. There have to be limits to religious liberty. But then the immediate question is the same as that asked by the theonomists. By what standard? What will be your standard to decide when to limit religious liberty? This is where imposing morality enters the equation once again. If it's a Muslim standard, the limits would be set around saying anything offensive about Muhammad or Allah. If it's a secular standard, the limits will, be, will perpetually move, depending on what is found offensive or hurtful by the group in power at any point in time. We must find solid ground for religious liberty. And the only true solid ground is the Bible. The limits must be objective biblical limits where some objective wrong is done to another person, like in the case of child sacrifice. There's much more that could be said about this, and I'm sure there are things I could clarify. But I hope this serves to show how the Bible provides a solid basis for religious liberty. And I think I'll close by quoting Article 7 of the 39 Articles of Religion, because I know a lecture like this brings up many questions about how to properly apply the law of Moses. And I believe Article 7 very wisely sets the parameters of how to do it. It says, Although the law given from God by Moses, as touching ceremonies and rites, do not bind Christian men, nor the civil precepts thereof ought of necessity to be received in any commonwealth, yet notwithstanding, no Christian man whatsoever is free from the obedience to the commandments which are called moral. 